Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. Uh, this is uh, an addendum to uh, the video I made on uh, reading and empathy which in itself was a response to Roz at Skelly Dandling around the books's uh, posing of the question. Uh, I will leave a link to, to that video uh, and Roz's but you just certainly don't need to um, revisit mine in order uh, you know, before you, you view this one. But I did just want to sort of elaborate on uh, some of the ideas raised in that. And I'm going to start with by showing you a gallery of uh, faces, uh, ordinary faces, not celebrities, uh, no one that you uh, <laughs> would, uh, would know in your personal life, uh, unless it's extreme coincidence. Um, and just just study each one as they pass for a you know a small amount of time. Don't worry, it's not going to be a pop quiz afterwards uh, to test your powers of observation. Um, although I will just ask a few general uh, questions uh, uh, about sort of the whole the whole thing of these faces. Um, so here are the faces. Okay, so uh, I just want to uh, sort of ask you uh, whether, uh, you know, as you saw the faces, whether one or two of them sort of prompted uh, thoughts in you of, oh, that looks like somebody I know, or whether you just studied the faces uh, and began to, to try and read their stories from their faces, much like, you know, when you go into a portrait gallery, art gallery, and you see all these historical figures... Uh, who you've never heard of, but you, you start making up stories for them based on, obviously, their faces, uh, how they're looking at, at the painter, but also their clothes, uh, the decor behind them, all, all this sort of stuff. We, you know, we just can't help ourselves but make up stories. And I wonder if there was an element of that as you were looking at these faces. So just, just these sort of general, these general things. And what I want to say is that uh, none of those are real people. I got them off a website called thispersonisnotreal.com which works by taking loads and loads of images of faces and averaging out the features and sort of blending them and creating these, these, these uh, portraits of people who never actually existed. And what I want to go and talk about is, is how this relates to fiction. But, but first of all, let's just, let's just roll it back. Um, the, the sort of facial recognition, both in terms of, oh, that is a face, and obviously the more individual specific of, that's a face of someone who I know, or a member of my family, or whatever, is hugely uh, sort of privileged within the human brain. I don't know if there's a specific area of the brain given over to it, but certainly there's a lot of sort of um, brain capacity given over to, to uh recognising faces. And, and why not? Because, in a, you know, when we're first born it's probably the most central and fundamental aspect for a child or for a newborn to begin to anchor it in uh, reality, to be able to socialise it, because that's its entry into the world of the rest of us by recognising the faces of its caregiver, by sort of stabilising the world that it finds itself sort of precipitated into. So it's hugely important uh, sort of function of our brain is to recognise faces. But there is a difference between a, a photo or a portrait of a face and having someone opposite you whose face you can see. Uh, and as an example of this, you know, how a colon uh, followed by a dash followed by a bracket. Again, that sort of privileging part of our brain which wants to see face, you know, we'll see a face in that, even though it's just three punctuation marks. Uh, or a balloon which has a face on it suddenly 
becomes more than just a balloon. It sort of takes on a little bit of sort of character somehow. Or, you know, even strange arrangements of sort of taps and plug and, um, you know, drainage holes and stuff from certain angles can be taken as a face. So, we're, you know, our brain is always looking, you know, to create these, these faces. But as I say, there's a difference between a face that's given to you in, in a flat two-dimensional image, photo, painting, whatever, and uh, a face uh, sat opposite you. So, for example, if you took the face of any of the adults there and uh, they were sat in front of you or you saw them on a TV programme where they are talking about how they found their long-lost sibling, you know, after 20 years, they didn't know they had this sibling or whatever, and reading about it in a novel or a newspaper article. Now, obviously, the major difference is you have the visual of the person but in a, in a reportage, in written words, you don't have that visual. Or take the little girl who's in the gallery. You know, what happens if you see a police press conference about with her photo sort of, you know, all over the screen of how she's been kidnapped and reading whether a newspaper article on it or a work of fiction. There's a, there's a huge difference between the two. And, to, you know, this book by uh, W.G. Sebold called Austerlitz, which I've just finished, this picture appears in the book because uh, Sebold uses photos a lot. And in the book it's presented as a picture of the four-year-old protagonist who's called Jacques Austerlitz as a page boy in Prague. But it isn't. First of all, Jacques Austerlitz doesn't exist. Jacques Austerlitz is a fictional character created by Sebold. Um, this photo actually is a random photo of a boy in Stockport in the UK. So nothing to do with Prague. It's probably from a, it may be from a similar time scale from, you know, just before the outbreak of the Second World War that, uh, that this photo is purportedly set in. But Sabald bought or, 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 you know, came into possession of lots of random photos and weaved them into all of his novels. And I think it's sort of saying something about about character, whereby in this book, Jacques Austerlitz is a four-year-old in Prague who is sent away because of the, he's Jewish, because of the oncoming Nazis. Uh, and that he's of an age where he can't really recall uh, those memories of the first four years of his life. Plus they're overlaid by a completely new life in Britain. Um, and the book really is trying to unpeel back for him to recover those memories. But what this photo indicates is that the four-year-old boy in Prague did not follow his uh, natural, as it were, developmental line uh, you know, as he aged. And ha instead had this sort of secondary one glommed on uh, due to the circumstance of having to flee the Nazis. But that's no more real. Uh, a life than the one that the four-year-old boy might have gone on to develop if he'd been allowed to, you know, follow his natural life that he should have had in Prague, you know, all things being equal. If the Nazis hadn't invaded and there wasn't a Second World War. So this photo is not real. It's not uh, being who it's purported to be. And the character that's purported to be isn't real either. And I think this is what Sable's saying about character and stuff. So just to return then to, to my gallery. So I said that they were formed by sort of blending average features of, of people. And in a way, this is what authors do, because authors are also writing characters who never existed. And there's an element of averaging out of generic you know, we authors um, reference what we understand by character, personality, humanity, and we pick and choose. You know, we're like magpies as we create each character. Uh, we only want the things that are going to help move the story along uh, or create a, ter a type of character that, w that we want to be the subject of our book. So I see them very similar to... Uh, you know, this person is not real, to any character in a novel, is not real. Even if they're sort of historical characters based based on, you know, people who exist in history, 
we don't really know what they were like. And the further back in history you go, say, to Julius Caesar, we don't really know what his character was like at all. So we're filling in all the gaps. You know, all we have is his name and a few key events. And, yes, he wrote the history of uh, the history of the invasion of Britain or something like that. So we have a few key texts, but they only give us a glimpse into Caesar's character. Um, obviously, as we get a bit closer to the modern day, uh, you know, we might have more information. But, for example, Stalin, uh, who, you know, died uh, just over 60 years ago, uh, 70 years ago now, um, we have a bit more understanding of him, but he's sort of summed up as, as you know, a, a psychopath, um, paranoid, and, and all these words, which allow you to write a, uh, an interesting novel on the character of Stalin, but they're not actually very good history. They're, they're not used in history as sort of fact, and they shouldn't really be used in history as an ex, you know, explanation of his actions, because history is made up of documented sources, uh, primary sources, secondary sources, and doesn't really have any room for the character of the major actors within history, of which obviously Stalin would be one. Um, so even within, even real life characters put into fiction or fictional representations of them, there's a lot of imaginative filling in of the gaps, like there is when you stare at a portrait in the portrait gallery. You're starting to read into their faces and make stories, make up your own stories for these people, really. But it's, it's more than that, I think, because characters not only don't exist, but we are asked, in, particularly in genre novels such as horror, supernatural, uh, science fiction, fantasy, we, the reader, are asked to suspend our belief in order to enter the world of the novel. And we're asked to suspend our belief in, in, uh, to enter the world of the novel because there's going to be a lot of logical cause and effect in that novel which isn't replicated in our own world. There's also going to be uh, sense data, you know, things we see and hear and stuff, Again, which doesn't accord to our everyday world. That's why you can have supernatural, that's why you can have fantasy, that's why you can have science fiction, all that sort of stuff. So in genre work, or certain genre work particularly, we, are, we the reader are asked to suspend our belief. Even, I would argue, in literary fiction, in which all of the logic and the sense perception is a, should be a one-to-one -one correlation with our own lives. But you are asked to suspend your belief in one key area, which is... You have to forget, you know, suspend your awareness that the person being or the characters being talked about in this book never existed, are not real. Like those characters in my photo gallery, that like those faces in that photo gallery I started this, this with. So even within literary fiction, although I don't think, uh, you know, a lot of people are aware of this, you are asked to suspend, suspend your belief. Now, coming to the question of empathy... You are being asked to empathise with a character who you've been asked to believe is credible, is believable, could exist in the real world by suspending your belief that, in fact, they never were and they never existed. You're being asked to empathise with a character who has, who's been constructed um, generically. Yes, taking specific things out of the generic picture of humanity... Uh, maybe what it's like to be a man or a woman or a Catholic or a footballer, you know, whatever it is, but still from a generic picture in which, you know, things have been plucked and then blended by the author to create this character in the same way as the features in the photos were blended. There is, however, a very small tranche of books who, don't, who never ask you to suspend your belief at any stage, because they're always pointing to their own fiction, their own fictional nature, their own fictiveness. So, for example, Georges Perec's 53 Days is divided into three parts. Part one is reading a manuscript by a writer about a, a detective. So it's avowedly fictional, part one. Part two puts a whole spin on that by providing seemingly what the author of that first book really wanted to say but had to codify it because it was controversial stuff so he created this whole sort of figment to stand in place as a cipher for what he really wanted to talk about and then part three is the author has died 
and these are the fragments of the stuff that he wasn't able to include because he didn't have time to finish it. But even that is fictive because all of this has been put together by Georges Perec, the author, who did actually die. This was his last book. And I think he was reflecting on that in the structure of this book. But at no time, I believe, is Perec saying, this is true to reality. You should believe this as fact. All the way through, I think it's pointed to its fictiveness. And another book, uh, which is David Markson's This Is Not A Novel, uh, also points to its fictiveness in a very different way, whereby it sort of say it's challenging and subverting every fixed um, point at which we understand what a novel is. It completely upends that. So at no point is Markson saying you need to suspend your belief in order to enter the world of this novel. What he's saying is you're wasting your time um, if you think this novel has anything to say about the real world, uh, despite the fact that it uses real words and real writings from a whole host of historical figures. I mean, that's the tension at the heart of the book. He is talking about fiction. And as I say, those are the books that, that I, you know, that's, that's my catnip. That, that's what I'm really interested in. Books that do not ask you to suspend your belief at all. Uh, but are constantly reminding you of their fictional nature. So I just wanted to throw that in. You know, the empathy uh, bits, in a way, are slightly tangential. But again, I, I return to say, how can you empathise with a character that never existed, that is made up of uh, a sort of blended set of averages from which a few specific uh, features have been plucked? You know, the fact that those those pictures at the beginning... They, they are recognisable faces, they are recognisably human, they are recognisably individual at some level in our brain, even though they never existed. And in a way, that translates very much to, to novel writing, that the characters in books are, are recognisably human. They may be recognisably a Catholic, a man, a woman, a footballer, whatever it is. But they're, that's done by the imaginative and creative skill of the author, because they're not... You know, they may be based on people, but they are not actual people. So, as I say, you're empathising with someone who never existed. You're empathising on the basis of a generic picture shaped in a specific way. Therefore, again, I say I'm not sure you can learn empathy through reading. Or if you can, you're learning a very peculiar form of empathy for things that don't exist. Anyway, that's what I wanted to add uh, by way of, of this fa endlessly fascinating question. Uh, so, until next time, thanks very much.